We have come to Parsha Bo, which as we were talking about in my class today, the word Bo in uh, Hebrew can mean both come and go. I've entitled this sermon, A Break with the Past. But before I speak, let me go to the Lord in prayer. Blessed Lord our God, you who watch over each and every sparrow that falls, watch over us. You have our best interests at heart. And towards that end, Lord, you left these texts for us to study, to uh, reveal your heart to us, to teach us the ways of how we might live, and to point us, Lord, to the final redemption that we seek I pray this all in the name of our Messiah, Yeshua, and I ask that you give me the words to speak and give us all ears to hear and minds to understand. I pray that we will transform our walks with you each day to come closer and to seek our future. B'Shem Yeshua. Amen. <clears throat> you know, uh, as... As a leader in a congregation, you're often faced with a question, which is, in, in my case, a professional question. How do you console the inconsolable? How do you uh, give hope to the hopeless? And it is a tall order. And I confess, I rarely feel equal to the task. And that's made all the more frustrating because in this particular calling, we're charged with carrying forth the good news, the Basora. It is the greatest consolation. It is the greatest uh, gift you can give to someone in need of consolation, the greatest hope, the brightest future for anyone who crosses our threshold. The difficulty lies in communicating that good news and its associated hope to persons who are in crisis who are experiencing something difficult, often unspeakably difficult. And as we learned last week, when Moses brought the good news to the children of Israel, they were unable to hear it because of the anguish of the spirit and the cruel bondage. But again, as I wanted to point out, as I pointed out last week, let's point out again, even in that, we can find a glimmer of hope because all of them were saved even though they were unable to hear the good news of their pending deliverance. So while they may not have been able to hear the good news, they certainly ended up being witness to it and receivers of it. God in his manifestation to them God intended that their freedom and deliverance happen one way or the other because he had to do that for the sake of mankind. What he had to do was disassemble the Egyptian civilization that had grown. He had decided the time was right to reveal himself to his creation so that they would realize that he is the only stay and trust who can be relied upon. In order to do that, he had to dismantle this false stay and trust, this false security, this counterfeit, death-obsessed religion of darkness and enslavement, which is something humans inevitably create when left to our own devices in the absence of God. The false civilization that we tend to stubbornly cling to, he had to tear down. Faulty values, faulty assumptions that we grip a hold of very tightly. Make no mistake, nothing that man creates apart from God can lead to true justice. No form of man-made religion, no form of man-made governance, no form of man-made civilization can even pretend to embrace true justice if it turns away from the one true God of the universe, the only source of justice. In the case of the Bible, all of these 
man-made things were neatly encompassed in the word Egypt or Mitzrayim in Hebrew. The narrow place, a narrowing, a tight place. It means something akin to confinement. Walls closing in is the image you can put in your head. <clears throat> all man-made Egypts that we ever build all end in the same way. Spiritual incarceration, spiritual enslavement, spiritual bond. But as our master Yeshua commanded us to remember in our prayers, your will be done as in heaven, so on earth. Therefore, Parshabo, this Torah portion, and indeed all of the Torah dedicated to the Passover and the Exodus, is the story of deliverance. It's the story of God's will, heavenly will, being manifest on earth. Freedom from death, freedom from bondage, freedom from our man-made prison of Egypt. A great release accomplished by the grace of God with great signs and wonders and an outstretched arm. The story of Exodus is nothing less than God himself coming into the world in which we live in order to grant us the ability to live in a just society, to walk in a righteous way, to transform our way of life and indeed our very hearts to his way of life and to his heart. Yeshua, the ultimate deliverer, did his work at the time of the remembrance of the Passover. And thereby he teaches us that the Passover story of freedom and redemption is the central hope of all mankind for the ultimate freedom and redemption that awaits us in the future. <coughs> These texts in Parsha Vayera and in Bo and Beshalach, as well as all the rest of the Exodus story, will give all of humanity a picture of exactly what God plans to do for the future for his beloved children. He will, as we said last week, free them, deliver them, redeem them, and take them. That is our future. That's his part in it all. He did all that, and he will do all that. But what about our part? Surely, we, uh, we do know that while salvation is by grace... We're not simply passengers on the salvation cruise ship. We don't just sit there and let it happen to us. God looks for hearts that look for him. But for most of us, stuck in our own Egypt, we begin to wonder, am I included among those he wishes to save? When things get very difficult, we begin to question. Or perhaps we envision a life lived Toward him, perhaps we envision that such a thing is out of our reach. We simply can't do it. Perhaps it just seems too uncertain, too distant, or alternatively, we might consider ourselves just plenty comfortable right here in our little old Egypt, just as parts of the Exodus story depict for us uh, about our ancestors. Who needs this God? We've got this golden calf. That's another attitude we tend to Hold on to. There are many forms of bondage. Sometimes we are pressed by others, but just as often, our bondage is of our own making. But regardless of its source or, co or cause, we must believe that it is not God's will that we succumb to bondage and face a dark and lonely future. Because it's written, remember these hopeful words in Ezekiel 33, 11, Say to them, as I live, it is a declaration of Adonai. I have no pleasure in the death of the wicked, but that the wicked turns from his way and live. Return, return from your evil ways. Why will you die, O house of Israel? And again, another hopeful thought in Matthew 18, 14. Even so, he says, it's not the will of your Father in heaven that one of these little ones should be lost. God doesn't want us to be lost. And again in 2 Peter 3, 9, the Lord is not slow in keeping his promise as some consider slowness, 
Rather, he is being patient toward you, not wanting anyone to perish, but for all to come to repentance. You see, there's something he wants for us. God knows and God loves you. And God does not desire that even a single one of us be lost. But it is equally clear that our repentance is a key element in this beautiful relationship with our creator. I think our text today (coughs) holds a very powerful but subtle message for us as to how we are to identify those things we must repent of. Central, of course, to the Passover story is the Korban Pesach, the Passover lamb, the Passover offering, a lamb without blemish, whose shed blood on the doorposts and lintel was the sign which God beheld so that the angel of death would pass over that house. The spotless lamb died so that those who subscribed to it would not die. The Torah portion today gives the commandment of the Korban Pesach. First, God gives the commands to Moshe. To, uh, in Exodus chapter 12, verses 1 through 20. So that's where you first hear God's commands to Moses regarding the Passover. And then Moses transmits those commands to the people of Israel. That's in chapter 12, verses 21 through 27. And then verse 28 confirms that the people, in fact, did it. So that if you want to look through that chapter, that's the way that rolls out. In 12.3, God tells Moses, so this is speaking to Moses. He says this, verse 3, Tell all the congregation of Israel that on the tenth day of this month, each man is to take a lamb for his family, one lamb for the household. On the tenth of this month, Yichu lachem ish se lebet avot se lebet. He commanded them to take Yichu, Yehu, each man on behalf of the fathers of the house. That's what it says. Beit le beit avot. On the behalf of the fathers of the house, a lamb. One lamb to a house. One is sufficient. Rich people are not going to be more saved by offering 10 Passover lambs and painting the entire front wall in blood. The emphasis here is that the Korban Pesach is sufficient to save the house in the tribe of Israel. It saves individually and it saves the precious family which subscribes to it. Later, we will learn about how many are to subscribe to that Passover lamb so that everyone gets a portion. None are left out. The concern here is that all can individually participate And no one gets doubles, and no one gets none. For those of you with many children in a buffet-style dinner, that probably sounds very familiar in your household. But in verse 21, now this is Moshe transmitting these commands to Israel. Moshe, the teacher, transmits the commandment. And in this, he makes a very subtle teaching. For this, we have to rely on the King James Version because, unfortunately, many translations obscure uh, the underlying Hebrew in order to make the English easier to read. So the KJV of 1221 says, Then Moses called for all the elders of Israel and said to them, Draw out and take you a lamb according to your families and kill, slaughter the Passover. Moses took the singular command, take, and made it a double imperative. Whereas God told him to tell the Israelites, take a lamb, Moshe says to them, draw out and take. Mishchu uchechu. The uchechu of the command, the take, he received from God, is now paired and subsequent to this word mishchu, draw out. And take. Perhaps Moshe knew the Israelites well enough to know that they, he needed to emphasize something in this teaching. So let's explore what that might be. 
First, this word that God told Moshe back in 12.3. Ve'yichu, and you take. Then, as Moshe put it, u'yechu, they shall take. The Hebrew word is lechach, take. This has some interesting senses to it. Its most basic sense is to take as with your hand. Take. Which implies taking possession. But it also has the sense of receiving. Not just taking, but receiving into your hand. And it also, it's also used in a matrimonial sense. It's said over and over in the Bible, take a bride. So there's a joining together. <clears throat> These two, receiving and taking a bride, carry with them the sense of commitment, of devotion. This simple word has a very power, powerful spiritual undertone to it. When you take the lamb, you receive it and you devote yourself to it. You receive what the lamb gives. You possess its spiritual essence when you take it. And by taking, you receive the blessing it gives you. The word that Moshe, our teacher, brought as an interpretation of God's command, the second word is equally as subtle in its spiritual essence. <coughs> it has only one occurrence in this form in the entire Tanakh, and it's right here in Exodus 21, 12, 21. This unique word is generally accepted as derived from the root shachak, to draw out. And this root occurs in several places, all well translated as draw or draw out, as in to draw a bow or to pull something out. A drawn out blast of the shofar, that's another, another use of the term, a long blast. But elsewhere, the prophet Isaiah uses it in a very subtle and different way. In, uh, I don't have uh, slides for this, but in chapter 18, it occurs twice, in verse 2 and verse 7. And Isaiah uses it to, for scatter his, uh, his, his verse talks about the scattering of the children of uh, Israel. And similarly, Solomon actually used it in Ecclesiastes, as in to give over. So scattering and giving over are also senses of this word. Both of these senses have a sense of release, of letting go. All of these things, if you will note, taking and scattering and releasing and all that, they all have to do with the actions of our hands. So release, let go, cast off. In this sense, both words <clears throat> have something to do with actions we can take with our hands. A hand takes and a hand releases. So what might this be telling us about this interesting thing? As my major professor John Fisher points out, citing a midrash by uh, Ramban, Nachmanides, it seems to be saying, first let go, and then take. The Rambam, inter Ramban, pardon me, interpreted it as saying that the Israelites needed to release the grip of idolatry before they could take the Korban Pesach, hence the doubling of the command by Moshe. He knew something about the people he was teaching. <clears throat> but what are we letting go and what are we taking? This strain of thought in the Midrash draws on the meaning to conclude that God was telling them they must release something before they could take hold of their lamb. The lamb was an animal sacred to the Egyptians who worshipped images of the lamb and would never kill one because it was sacred. In the act of slaughtering the lamb, Israel was making a decisive and clean break with the past rejecting what was formerly held sacred, in a sense, smashing the cultural norms of the day in which they live as an act of being freed from the bonds of that oppressive, enslaving 
self-absorbed culture. The Exodus story is about the destruction of the false religion and wicked civilization of Egypt, which had enslaved God's children. Now, the Torah doesn't tell us that the Israelites actually worshiped the false gods, but it does imply that they were engulfed in the culture that did, enwrapped in it, steeped in it, however you want to say that steeped in the values of Egypt. In order to be free to worship God according to his commands and live according to his values, they had to release any connection to Egypt. Slaughtering their lamb was as if they slaughtered the false god named Knum, or Kenum, however you pronounce that. Timed as it was right after the death of the firstborn, it's also significant to understand that in Egyptian mythology, (coughs) Kanum was thought of as a potter, a potter who molded human babies out of clay and put them into the mother's womb. It was Kanum who was said to have molded all the other gods also. It is uh, this that the Israelites released or scattered, freeing their hand, which was now empty, in order to serve the one true God, the actual creator of mankind. In in reading about this, I was reminded of my grandfather's naturalization papers. He came over from Ukraine in 1895. And the naturalization papers included an oath swearing allegiance to America. But in that oath, they had to swear, he had to swear, I hereby renounce any connection to Nicholas, czar of all the Russias. And when he did that, he did that in the acceptable manner with his left hand on the Bible and his right hand raised. The weak hand made strong by standing on the foundation of God's word and the strong hand empty, free of obligation, ready to do the good work for the nation to which it was being adopted into. He literally did what Moshe said, mishu uchachu, he released and took hold of simultaneously. He released the bondage of the czar and took hold of the liberty that characterized at least a former America of the late 19th century. He released the anti-Semitic pogroms of Russian orthodoxy in Ukraine and grabbed hold of the ideal of America, which at that time held that all men are created equal as its foundation. Not so sure how we stand today. We're even redefining men in that statement. But that's for another time. This thing, letting go and taking, is precisely what we are to do as people coming to faith in Yeshua. We must let go of things which hold us in bondage in order to take hold of God's freedom. Egypt was the greatest kingdom on earth. Translated into more modern parlance, it was the dominant culture. It was the leader of all civilization at that time. It had an intricate false religion and many creature comforts and technology that wowed everyone. It led the world in that. It was what we might call a first world nation today. It came with cultural assumptions. Gods could be depicted in images and statues. They were very obsessed with images. We see them today when archaeologists go in. Everything is painted with murals. Kings were gods with supernatural powers. Magicians advised kings. The goal in life was to amass physical wealth in this life and take it with you into the next life. And not all men were created equal. Social position determined value. Those that led the country before had to be canceled 
when someone else came to power and their faces observed, obscured and everything they did. Those who had been your salvation in the past, meaning the Israelites, were now your enemies to be feared and cruelly oppressed. Cruelty was part and parcel of life. Slaves were forced into the tomb with their dead master in order to die and serve him in the next life. A slave in this world, a slave in the next world. Egypt was cold and heartless and calculating. Contrast that with God's freedom. God is releasing the Israelites to take them to Sinai in order to give them the gift of the Torah. The goal of the Passover is the Torah. Or said another way, the end of the Passover is the law. No longer subject to Pharaoh's unjust corrupted laws, they will receive and live by the royal law of God. The Torah which honors human dignity which guarantees the rights for the poor and the less fortunate, which guarantees a day off for laborers and kings alike, which ensures that lands are not lost to a family because of hard times, which provides for forgiveness of sin and covering of guilt, which guarantees reparations for wrongs and limits punishment to what is reasonable. Mishhu uchehu, let go of the culture of Egypt, take hold of the ways of God. You will not be able to have both in your hand. Your subscription to the ways of God is depicted in the portion of the flesh of the lamb that you eat. The Torah is actually contained in the flesh of the lamb. Subscribe to the lamb and you subscribe to the royal law of God because that's why it was given so you could go get that. There's no room in your hand for both. You can't get your portion of the lamb if your fist is stuffed with the assumptions of Egypt. You must first let them go, scatter them, as Isaiah used the word. And this is the same for communion with Yeshua. When we come to the table of the Lord, I hope from this moment on that when you come to the Lord's table, you will think, let go and take, let go and take. That's how we should approach communion. Let go of the assumptions and take of the truth. Let go of secular civilization or modern Egypt and hold on to take Mashiach. This is what Yeshua taught in Matthew chapter 6, verse 24. No one can serve two masters, for either he will hate the one and love the other, or he will stick by one and look down on the other. You cannot serve God and money. That was Yeshua's take on money, it was the same giving up so you can take on the Lord. Or again, as he explained, to the rich ruler when he asked, what shall I do to have eternal life? Yeshua told him, keep the commandments and moreover, sell all you have and give to the poor. He had to give up, you see. He said in Matthew 19, 24, uh, 19, 23 through 24, then Yeshua said to his disciples, amen, I tell you, <coughs> it's hard for a rich man to enter the kingdom of heaven. Again, I tell you, it is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter the kingdom of God. Why is it hard? Because the desire for wealth becomes one's master. It is our civilization that tells us success is measured by money. But that's not what God teaches. It is his wealth. And if we amass it, we are to share it with the poor. We're to be a conduit for his wealth. But a million sermons have, sermons have been preached on that. I'm sure you've probably heard most of them. So what else might we let go? Anything, I say, anything which contradicts God. Consider the man-made assumptions of our modern Egypt. Our Egypt, which focuses its energy on the things of the flesh. 
Do we hold in our hand false assumptions of our man-made civilization? Can we, can we actually manipulate our reality as we're told constantly on the internet? Or is it okay to go along with those who think we can? Do we agree with Hollywood when they portray villains as good and good as evil? That good guys can be bad and bad guys can be good. Do we agree with that? Do we have the assumption that people in power can behave badly because, well, that's just the way it is? It doesn't take much thought to consider the kinds of things that we might fill our hand with, which are derived not from the word of God, but from our civilizational assumptions and the things we have absorbed in this civilization. Those are the things which will keep us from taking our full portion of the lamb because our hand is already full. <clears throat> what does it say in 1 Peter chapter 2, 1 and 2? So get rid of all malice and deceit and hypocrisy and envy and all lashon hara, evil tongue, as newborn babes long for pure spiritual milk so that by it you may grow towards salvation now that you have tasted that the Lord is good. Does our civilization push on us? Cynicism, malice, deceit, hypocrisy? Is this something we've learned to accept being steeped in modern Egypt? Let's consider what Paul says in Galatians, a fantastic list in chapter 5, verses 19 through 21. Now the deeds of the flesh are clear, sexual immorality, impurity, indecency, idolatry, witchcraft, hostility, strife, jealousy, rage, self-ambition, dissension, factions, envy, drunkenness, carousing, and all things like these. I'm warning you, just as I warned you before, that those who do such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. They can't hold on to those things. If their hands are full of that, there's no room for their portion of the lamb. And how many of those things does our society elevate and exalt? These and a million things like them are the things we must scatter and release before we take our subscription, our portion of the Lamb of God. <clears throat> In Luke, part of Luke chapter 16, verse 15 says, For what is prized among men is detestable in God's sight. Perhaps Yeshua's clearest teaching about our need to break with the past and our need for a complete paradigm shift is contained in Matthew chapter 16, 21 through 26, as the time approached for his selfless act of love on the torture stake, on the cross. The gospel writer tells us, from that time, Jesus began to show his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem and suffer many things from the elders and chief priests and scribes and be killed and on the third day be raised. And Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him, saying, Far be it from you, Lord, this shall never happen to you. But he turned and said to Peter, Get behind me, Satan, you are a hindrance to me, for you are not setting your mind on the things of God, but on the things of men. His attitude was a fleshly human attitude. Then Jesus told his disciples, if anyone would come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. For whoever would save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. For what will it profit a man if he gains the whole world and forfeits his soul? Or what shall a man give in return for his soul? Deny ourselves and take up our cross. Release the old things and join in his crucifixion. Just as Moshe had hinted in his teaching, release and receive the things that hinder us from the complete communion with God are the things that society, which places itself, places the self above all else, tells us we cannot live without. Exactly these things Yeshua tells us we cannot live with. Once we release these, then truly we can take the flesh of the lamb and all that it contains, the spiritual food, 
can transform us when we let go of the things we cling to and realize all that bread of communion contains, all the spiritual truth that it contains. This is the power of the Passover. This is the power of the communion, the release of the old assumptions, even death of the old person just as the lamb died in order to grab hold of flesh of the lamb and come to a new life. This is the power of the resurrection for those that subscribe to the work of the Passover lamb. Now, this time I was good and I made summary points for you. So we can bring those up. Point one, Exodus and the Passover are central to our understanding of freedom and redemption and Egypt represents bondage as it was a man-made civilization, which always end up in bondage. Next slide. <clears throat> um, Yeshua used the bread of the Passover meal to link communion to the Passover lamb. And then God com commanded Moses to tell the Israelites to take the Passover lamb. Point two, Moses the teacher interpreted God's command for the Israelites. Mishku uchechu, draw out and take. These are actions done with our hands. Uh, taking, receiving, or taking possession. Isaiah uses this root word, lachach, to mean scatter. Therefore, the word sometimes has this sense of letting go. Um, Moses seems to be saying, release what you hold on to from Egypt before you can receive the Passover lamb. Since Yeshua made communion a direct link to Pesach, this teaching also applies there. And the third point, human civilization immerses us in things that God detests. Modern Western culture is not unlike Egypt in many ways. What might we need to release from our grip before we can take communion? You think about that. And then here's a list of scriptures that I believe I cited today. And then finally adding in Matthew 16. So... When you go back to watch this, you can pause and get all those notes. <laughs> Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Blessed Lord our God, our Father in heaven, we thank you so for the opportunity to come together to hear your word, to recognize in its deep spiritual meaning, Lord, the things we must do in our everyday life in order to live closely with you. Help us, Lord, to let go of those assumptions that are in our society, assumptions that are counter to your truth. Help us to instead grab hold of the truth of Yeshua and take our part in the Passover that he did for us. And I pray this all in his name. Amen.